So I was kind of perplexed about what I was going to say today because I'm not a media expert by any stretch of the imagination. But I was speaking with Jonathan Pajot this morning because he's staying in the same, same Airbnb as my wife and I. And he suggested that I talk to you about my experiences with media over the last year. And I thought, well, that's A, that's something I know about. So it's always good when you're talking to people to talk about something that you know about. That's actually a really good tip for public speak. Well, it's really true. You have to remember that. You should know about three times as much about the topic as you need to talk about the topic. And then you have places you can go and, you know, you can wander around a little bit and be a little spontaneous. So that's really useful. And But then I also thought that makes sense because nobody knows anything about the situation with regards to the media now. And so we're all feeling our way because the technological transformations are so rapid and, you know, they're going to come one after the other in the next 10 years. I don't think we can even imagine what's coming down the pipes. And we're all struggling to keep up. And, you know, we don't even know how much of the current state of more radical political polarization is actually a secondary consequence of technological transformations that we don't understand. Because I was thinking today about Facebook and about Twitter and about YouTube and about the idea that people are in an echo chamber. And I'm not really sure that's the right metaphor. I think we might be in an amplifier rather than an echo chamber. I've thought for a long time that when I'm, when I'm thinking about the effect of the individual, I, I read something that Solzhenitsyn said at one point, and I think he was citing a, an ancient Christian theologian who defined the universe as a place that's, whose circumference was nowhere and whose center was everywhere. And I really like that idea. It's, and I think it's actually relatively true from a technical perspective, like from a physical perspective. But Solzhenitsyn pointed out that each of us was to be regarded as a center of the cosmos and, and that we have the power that's associated with that. And I've thought about that a lot because there's something about it that's, it's either obviously true or it's true enough so that we all act it out when we interact with each other because we treat each other like conscious beings who have a destiny and ha who have choices and who make choices that are important and who make choices that can be good or bad or even good and evil. We all act like that, so we, we act that out. And I was thinking that you can think of network models in that way, you know. You can think of human beings as like nine billion dots in a row and there's no connections between the dots and then you're sort of like a dust moat in the wind and who the hell cares what you think anyways and you don't have any impact on things or you can recognize that you're at the center of a networked system and that, you know, you know a thousand people or you will in your lifetime or perhaps more than a thousand people and then they know a thousand people so you're separated by one person from a million and two people from a billion. And that's a much better way to think. And we are seriously networked together. And we're networked together more now than we ever have been. And so one of the things that that might mean is that the choices you make are amplified and distributed not only far faster than they ever have been, but with far more impact. And, you know, one of the things that Carl Jung pointed out was that well, he had this idea that when science, that, el you know, alchemy is the root of science in some sense. It's this dreamlike substrate out of which science emerged. And alchemy was a kind of a weird admixture of religious thinking and scientific thinking because those two things hadn't been differentiated back when there were alchemists. And Jung believed that what had happened in, in Europe, at least first, was that the scientific end of alchemy blew up and expanded at an exponential rate and that led to this advanced technological civilization that we have but that the moral dimension that was embedded in the religious symbolism didn't develop at all and so we're in this unstable situation where far more technologically proficient than we are wise and that that's actually a big problem because obviously the more powerful the tools you generate the more intelligent ethically you better be or things are going to really are going to go to hell in a handbasket very rapidly. And I had this thought, I think I shared it a little bit last night, that, you know, in the next five years, six years, we're going to develop pretty viciously intelligent AI systems. And that's already happening. You know, I mean, they're monitoring YouTube and they're monitoring Facebook and they're monitoring Google and they're trying to make ethical decisions, these AI systems. And the problem is, is that the ethical presuppositions of the programmers are being embedded into the infrastructure of the net. And that's a hell of a thing to think, because it means that for better or worse, we're building automated intelligences that reflect our own morality. And we better be very careful about what our morality is if we're going to automate it, because automated systems are incredibly powerful. So that's where we're at, at least to some degree, in terms of the new technological transformations with in communication technology. You know, it puts each of us at the, at the center of a wide web of connections and makes the consequences of our moral decisions much more immediately manifest to each of us. It kind of begs the question, too, like, how should you behave on Facebook and how should you behave on Twitter? I think Twitter drives me a little bit crazy 
crazy. I'm on it a fair bit. I'm not sure it's a good thing. And I tend to distribute things that are alarming, let's say, in some sense, maybe they're alarming ideological, or ideologically, they're disturbing. And I was thinking about that today in preparation for this talk, and I wasn't really sure that was necessarily a good idea, because there are a lot of alarming things happening all the time, everywhere, obviously. And now we can share all of them, always, all the time. And so that means that instead of hearing about one alarming thing a day, you're hearing about like 500 alarming things a day. And so then what are you supposed to do about that? Is that does that indicate the state that there's a state of emergency? Well, you don't know because you don't know how to calibrate the information. So I was thinking, well, maybe the right way to behave on Twitter is only to forward good things that are happening, you know, because there's lots of good things that are happening. But I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I, I have no idea and I don't think anybody else does either. I do know that there are studies with regards to Facebook that show that the more time that you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are. And that it looks like it's a causal relationship rather than just a correlational relationship. And it seems to have something to do with the fact that Facebook is one of those platforms where everybody puts up an advertisement for their life, right? It's like, here I am with my new girlfriend in the Bahamas being happy. And then here I am on a mountain being happy. And it's like, it's not you like miserable with a cover over your head, unable to get out of bed. You don't broadcast that. You can think, well, that means you're presenting people with a falsely positive view of your life. And then they compare their lives to it and they come up short. And you think, well, that's a kind of deception. But by the same token, you don't stop random strangers on the street and tell them how miserable your life is, right? They don't want to hear about that. They, they want to see a facade of normality in, you know, just casual day-to-day -day interactions. And so part of pro-social behavior is only to put what's at least, you know, normative and good forward. It doesn't matter. I mean, so I don't think that's necessarily deception, but the mass consequence of that is something that we don't understand at all.